So it's uh, really my distinct honor to uh, introduce our beloved Dr. Call uh, for this Grand Rounds presentation. Um, she uh, completed her medical school at University of Maryland and uh, subsequently did her residency, chief residency year and um, a fellowship in general internal medicine at University of Alabama in Birmingham. Uh, she then was uh, wandered to the University of Louisville for four years as an associate uh, program director there, and we were fortunate enough to recruit her to become our program director in 2000, and she led our program for 16 years into 2000, until the year 2020, where she uh, passed the reins after, with her mentorship and guidance to Becky Miller, who is our current program director. Uh, she's remained as our associate uh, chair of education, um, so um, and she's a professor of internal medicine. She really, uh, under the leadership, uh, her leadership as residency director, she really put our residency program on the map, the national map, uh, with her innovation uh, in medical education. That's uh, really a model for many programs around the country. Um, she, um, she's really devoted herself to education. She's, uh, she's really a teacher's teacher and a really a model for all of us in academic medicine going forward. Uh, she's had many, many awards. I can't really uh, detail all of them because there's so many of them. Uh, but she uh, recently uh, had the Associates Pro Program uh, Director Distinguished Medical Education Award. She's gotten the Enrico Gersten uh, Education Award here at VCU. And she also was the VC Distinguished uh, Teaching Award, uh, which is our highest teaching award at VCU. She also is the ACP Laureate Award. So those are very, very prestigious awards. You know, one of these awards in someone's career is, is amazing. Uh, and I counted that she actually had 18 internal medicine uh, teaching awards uh, over her career. So that's got to be a record. I don't know. You know that's that's kind of crazy. Um, anyway, she's been an innovator, a leader, a mentor for, uh, for all of us in education. She was had been kind of at the forefront of looking at the milestones in medical education. Uh, so um, all that information and, 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 and really um, uh, her expertise, she is moving to a new challenge, and that is in Asheville, North Carolina, where she's actually starting a, a residency program from the beginning. So um, that'll be a challenge for her, and I'm sure she's up to it. So that's a, a, a we wish her all the best in her new endeavors in North Carolina. She has helped us over the last two years make the transition at VCU and and we incur we uh, look forward to an ongoing relationship with Steffi. So, thank you for giving grand rounds, Steffi, and welcome. Great, thank you. Um, and Lee, tell me if my slides aren't running right or if you cannot hear me. Um, so, I um, I know disclosure slides run, and I'm going to say and disclose right away because it's not on the disclosure slide that I am as nervous as I could possibly be giving grand rounds to a group of people that I really respect and that I've continued to learn from um, over the last 18 years um, is really intimidating. So bear with me as my nerves calm down. I am really excited um, to talk with you today about an area about which I have a ton of passion about, but also it's an area where we have all this tried and true sort of um, research and evidence and frameworks, but it's also an area where there's all kinds of new things happening and new ideas and new milestones and new competencies and new ways to do things hopefully better as we work towards producing the most talented health professionals, and specifically for us, internists for the future. So we're going to dive in and talk about evaluation and feedback in the competency-based medical education era, the era in which we live today. So at the end of this uh, 50 minutes, hopefully you will be able to define or at least be familiar with the definition of competency-based education. You'll be able to describe the milestones framework and also in trustable professional activities framework that we use in undergraduate medical education. You'll be familiar with the ACGME Miles 2.0 project, which is rolling out, has already rolled out in some specialties like cardiology, but will be rolling out in the rest of our specialties and our core program in July of 2021. So we're gonna talk a lot about that and how evaluations are gonna change and get you ready for what's coming. 
And then we're going to dive into your important role as an evaluator um, and the important role of direct observation. And when I say that, many times our learners are thinking, oh, this doesn't pertain to me. This isn't important to me. You guys are just as important in this, um, these concepts because we want you to understand the milestones and the EPAs and you evaluate, you evaluate your teachers, you evaluate the medical students, you evaluate each other. So just as important for you to be absolutely outstanding in these areas. And then lastly, we're gonna highlight some of the key components of effective feedback. And I'll share with you that we chose to do this for Grand Rounds for several reasons. Number one, we know that the milestones are rolling out and we want to make sure everybody's prepared and has a good understanding of that framework. Number two, in the clerkship, Dr. Phoebe Ashley and her team, Nate Warner, Rabia Kaiser, have worked really, really hard to improve the clerkship and the structure of evaluations. And one of the things that they've been seeing is, a, is maybe a little bit of an, an uncomfortableness or discomfort with the rhyme scale. So we're gonna talk specifically about that to help prepare you all to better evaluate medical students. And then the third reason is that in our ACGME surveys, we see that one of the areas that we could improve across the specialties in internal medicine is in providing better feedback to our residents and fellows. So that's what's really driving this grand rounds. So let's talk a little bit about competency-based education. And I'm, what I'm gonna do is to contrast it to our traditional medical education systems. And I'm gonna just use medical school training as an example, but you could do the exact same thing looking at residency training or fellowship training. And so you see at the top of this slide here, the traditional system, four years of medical school, lockstep, everybody moves through year one, studying anatomy, physiology, micro, et cetera, and then, and you pass your exams, you get your grades, you show up, and then you move to year two, pathology, pharmacology, et cetera. You pass your exams, you show up, you get your grades, and then you move to year three, and you go through your clinical rotations, you show up, you pass your exams, et cetera, and then you move to year four, and then you're done. And everybody does exactly the same thing in lockstep. And again, you can say the same thing about residency program or fellowship. Contrast that with competency-based education which is really where we are now, where the years of medical school, you are learning in an integrated fashion across the continuum of the four years and integrated the science, the patient care, the application, the teamwork, the knowledge, integrated throughout, threading through your experiences, which are also intertwined. Our medical school is in the middle of this transition um, and our residency is a great example of this transition. So rather than it just being PGY one year, two year, three year, and when July shows up, you all of a sudden have more responsibilities. As all of you know, our residents move through phases, learner, manager, teacher, leader, and there are blurred lines because how you advance is not just based on time. So in the competency-based education model, the focus is on retention and application, demonstration of ability as a guide to advancement and graduation. So some highlights of the competency-based education and training models, again, focuses on application of a core set of knowledge, skills, and attitudes that result in outcomes. I was challenged by a fellowship director that said, what the heck is the outcome? Well, the outcome is the development of a health professional that can practice at a defined level of proficiency and serve the community that you are training them to serve. In these competency-based training models, the learner has a tremendous amount of responsibility. They need to know where they're going. They need to be responsible for taking those steps, driving their education, going from phase to phase and mastering those skills and that knowledge set and those attitudes as they move towards um, that level of proficiency. The emphasis is on partnering with the learners by providing formative assessment, by coaching them through that. And so lots of evaluation, lots of a feedback, um, working through a deliberate practice model, which we'll touch on shortly. The focus is on the observation of real tasks. So you are in there observing your learners. Learners are in there observing each other um, so that you can provide that basis for assessment. And the assessment is based on objective, observable, measurable achievements, specific behaviors, not on peer comparison, because nothing about this is about comparing to others. It's about achieving certain milestones as you move forward. 
And one of the most exciting things about the competency-based training models is that it allows for variable development over time. A wonderful example of this is the um, Graduate When Ready or Competency-Based Graduation Program that has been running that right now, um, Sarah Hobgood from Internal Medicine is really running, started by Sally Stanton and a group. Um, and some of our medical students are now graduating before they finish four years because they're a competency-based model, not just a time-based model. Everything about this model suggests that development is non-linear. People will advance, but it's not just a straight line. They go up, they go down, they're moving around. So this um, slide comes from a slide that Eric Combo presents very frequently with the ACGME based on the Dreyfus and Dreyfus development model, which we definitely use, but it just, it's too simplified. It's not linear. Learners are gonna be on their own individual path as they move through their trajectory and their journey. So competence, we use that word a lot. So how do we define competence? And I've chosen to use Ole Tenkati, who is really the leader in entrustable professional activities and some of our competency and milestone literature. Ole Tenkati defines competence. Competence entails more than the possession of knowledge, skills, and attitudes. It requires you to apply these abilities in a clinical environment to achieve optimal results. So it's not just that you check the box on specific things. It's the integration and the mastery and the application and demonstration in the clinical environment. Competency, per Ole Tenkai, is an observable ability of a health professional integrating multiple components such as knowledge, skills, values, and attitudes, but the highlights on the integration. We refer frequently to the ACGME core competencies. Those were originally published in the early 2000s. Um, and, um, you know, some of our medical students were like, I don't know, in kindergarten at that point in time. Um, these are the broad and overarching organizing framework for GME assessment. And you're so familiar with this terminology now. Care of patients, medical knowledge, interpersonal and communication skills, systems-based practice, practice-based learning and improvement, and professionalism, the six ACGME core competencies. These are the driver and the framework for the milestones. The milestones is where we're gonna move next. And I just want to highlight some of the resources on the ACGME website to help faculty, to help learners, to help clinical competency committees, to help program directors, as they work with the new Milestones 2.0 publications, there are handbooks to each one. There are guidebooks to each one. There are suggestions for resources and toolkits um, and really wonderful descriptions for every single specialty, cardiology, endocrine, hematology, oncology. Give credit to Laura Edgar and um, Eric Holmbo who led the development of each of our specialties milestones. It was such a privilege. I got to be on the Internal Medicine Milestones 2.0 committee and it was a real privilege to work with them. All of these milestones were developed by program directors um, for each specialty who worked through formal consensus processes to get to the finalized milestones. The milestones 2.0 were then reviewed by the community, feedback came back in and then they got refined. So that work product is rolling out this year. So what are milestones? Milestones are defined as predictable events in normal development. And learners may develop at different rates across different domains. They are analogous to the pediatric milestones. So I always like to use the 18 month pediatric milestones as an example of the development at different rates across domains. So there are different domains. So as you see by this, there's the domains of social emotional milestones that we would expect um, of around 18 months. But again, this is not set on time. It's just around in this area, we'd be looking for these things. There's a domain of language and communication. There is a domain of cognitive and there's a domain of physical development. So people develop differently in different domains. So I always use my, um, many of you know, I have three daughters. They are about each a year apart. And if we take the domain of language and communication, some of the milestones at around 18 months are saying several single words, shaking your head no, um, pointing to show someone what he or she wants. So I love the saying single words. Well, each of my three daughters developed at quite different rates. My youngest daughter, definitely the typical oldest child, overachiever, always perfect, you know, highest SAT scores, she started that way. So she was probably putting words together, saying way more than single words by 18 months. She was probably doing that by 14 months. 
my middle child, love her, slightly flaky, a little artsy, you know, might have been more like 20 months. My youngest child, she didn't need to talk. There was no reason for her to say several single words. She had the two of them to do everything for her. So maybe she didn't do that until more like 24 months. So they each got to that milestone at different rates, but they might've been doing things differently in other areas. And notably, it's not about when you get to the milestone, it is about you getting to the milestone and going to the next phase and going to the next phase and going to the next phase so that ultimately you get to that outcome. And the outcome of language and communication as ch children develop is that they are speaking and can have conversations and communicate well as they get older. And let me tell you, my kids are now 20, 18 and 17. I can't get them to stop speaking. So they're all completely competent in language despite the fact that they hit their milestones at different times. And so that is so analogous to our residents, our fellows and our medical students. People are going to hit milestones at different times and that is okay. Our job is to coach people, give them feedback and get them continuing to develop. So let's look at our milestones 2.0 and I've chosen some examples from different specialties so that you can look at them. And let's look at the anatomy of a milestone. So the milestones are organized in subcompetencies. This is from rheumatology and it is in the ACGME core competency of patient care. The subcompetency is physical examination. And in each of the subcompetency spreadsheets, there are one, two, or three rows. And the rows represent a set of progression, developmental progression of milestones. So each of these phrases is the actual milestone. So the rows of progressive set of milestones. So for this one in rheumatology physical examination, level one would be identifies the elements of a musculoskeletal exam. Level two would be performs all elements of a musculoskeletal exam in clinic on consults. Level three is performs a tailored comprehensive musculoskeletal exam, including advanced techniques when applicable. And level four performs a tailored comprehensive musculoskeletal exam that elicits subtle findings. Not all continue to have five sets. Some are, don't have a level one, some don't have a level five. And so each specialty has somewhere between 21 and 28 of these sub-competencies that are the milestone framework for that set of trainees in that specialty to achieve as they move through their residency or fellowship. Here's another example from cardiology. This one is in the ACGME competency of patient care as well. It is an invasive cardiovascular testing. And let's just take the first row. It has to do with um, vascular access and cardiac catheterization. Level one is this, that the learner can discuss the key steps and anatomy relevant to the procedure, very knowledge oriented. Level two moves to skill, obtains and manages vascular access with direct supervision. And there is a supervision level. Level three performs some elements of diagnostic cardiac catheterization with direct supervision. Level four performs diagnostic cardiac catheterization with direct supervision and level five independently. So there, that developmental set of progression really is hinged upon how much supervision and assistance someone needs. Another example from pulmonary, but moving to a different core competency, medical knowledge, and specifically the sub-competency of clinical reasoning. And so if we look at this row, the second row, this one is around clinical reasoning and diagnostic error. And again, the milestone in level one is identifies types of clinical reasoning errors with patient care with substantial guidance. Notice also adds level of supervision here or assistance. The next level in this row, so where you would expect a person to develop to next, is identifies types of clinical reasoning errors within patient care. So now in the context of patient care, they can identify it. So imagine yourself rounding with someone on pulmonary consults. So Dan Grinnan's rounding on pulmonary consults and he's watching a pulmonary fellow go through their differential diagnosis or just talking about maybe a team's differential diagnosis and he can identify maybe the reasoning errors that he thinks that the senior resident on the medicine team made. Level three applies clinical reasoning principles to retrospectively identify cognitive errors. 
So maybe this is Barry Fowler sitting down with a fellow going back over what they were thinking about a patient that they saw in pulmonary consults and that fellow being able to go back and really identify that they had availability bias as they had made that diagnosis of aspergillosis on that patient. Um, that next level, level four, continually reappraising one's clinical reasoning to prospectively minimize cognitive errors and managing uncertainty. And then level five, coaching others to recognize and avoid cognitive errors. And many times level five is about not just being able to do it, but going that next level to teaching, guiding, and coaching others. And then a last um, example from our specialties, HEMONC. Um, and this one is in the ACGME core competency of systems-based practice, the sub-competency of system navigation for patient-centered care, specifically population health. And here, again, this developmental set of milestones, starting with milestone level one, demonstrates the knowledge of population and community health needs and disparities, knowledge. Level two identifies, so going to, can they actually apply this, identify specific population and community health care needs and disparities. Perhaps it is a first year hematology oncology fellow who bumps into Dr. Barrett and says, you know, I have identified that there is a real access problem in our um, black female population accessing care for breast cancer. Um, and that's an identification. Level three, identifying local resources to meet community health care needs and disparities. Maybe that's a second year fellow saying, you know what? I, what if we worked with transportation more effectively and worked with primary care providers that are making referrals to us and there are some local resources that we can bring to bear? And then level four goes to really adopting practice to providing for the needs of specific populations. And level five goes to innovative strategies. So really getting to that advanced level. In our core program, same sort of thing, ACGME milestones. And so I've chosen just for the core program to illustrate one that's an in interpersonal and communication skills. And the sub competency is patient and family centered communication. So how does that intern interact with that family and with the patient? So let's look at this first row of developmental milestones. So milestone at level one uses language and nonverbal behavior to demonstrate respect and establish rapport. Level two, establishes and maintains a therapeutic relationship. So now it's moving to this relationship using effective communication behaviors in straightforward encounters. That next level of progression brings in challenging and patient encounters. So the differentiation of the developmental progression is how challenging is the encounter. Level four progresses to using shared decision-making. And then level five, again, brings in that coaches others. So development, set of progressive development milestones. So let's take a break from looking at these um, for a second. And how would these actually incorporate into your evaluation of learners? Well, with the new Milestones 2.0, as they are written in these nice sets of development progression, they actually can become items on your evaluations. I want to give a lot of credit to Gotham Kalahasty and Jeanette Wood, who have really built out beautiful cardiology evaluations already because their milestones came out early. Using this framework, pulmonary critical care, Lisa Brath and Stuart Bowden did a great job doing the same thing. Hemonk has also done this already. Right now, Laura Paletta Hobbs is spending all of her time for the core program, building out new evaluations with Allison Davinsky. Same kind of thing. So lots of people working in the background to turn these milestones into your evaluations. And that's why it's so important for us to focus on this. So let's take a quick break. And I want, I'm gonna share with you a video. And we're gonna use the milestone that we just looked at. So we just looked at this one, communication. And I'm going to, bear with me, stop sharing this for a second and um, share with you a video. And what we're going to do is we're going to watch this video and um, I'm going to ask you at the end of it to think about where you might plot this learner if this was a typical situation that you've seen over and over and over again with this learner in presenting a patient. And we're going to borrow from um, a video from Texas Tech. And you're focused on the communication milestone. Uh, Jonathan, uh, this is uh, Dr. Jones and our internal medicine service team. Hi. 
Hi, Jonathan. Uh, we're going to be, uh, I'm going to be presenting your case uh, to them. Is that all right if I do that in the presence of your girlfriend and uh, coworker here? Yes, right. that's fine. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so this is uh, the first UMC visit for Jonathan, who is a 24-year-old African-American um, with a history of sickle cell disease who presented with, to the emergency department uh, with a two-day history of bilateral knee pain. He's ectomorphic and is in moderate distress. Uh, the pain began Tuesday at approximately 4 a.m. Uh, while he was working a night shift at Walmart. He had uh, difficulty sleeping because of the pain uh, that night, and the pain gradually continued to increase due uh, to, to a severity of 8 out of 10 today. The pain was exacerbated with walking and standing, um, and was not significantly relieved with Percocet, um, which he received from another physician that we um, aren't sure who it was. Um, Jonathan has never experienced knee pain to this extent before, but he did say that he's had a few um, a few episodes in the distant past of knee pain. Um, the report he reports some chills and uh, mild shortness of breath, and but he denied fever, nausea, vomiting, cough, chest pain, abdominal pain, or recent trauma to the knees. Um, he has no other known medical illness um, and isn't on any chronic medication for sickle cell disease either. Uh, in the ED, he was given an IV bolus and received two doses of morphine at six milligrams and eight milligram doses. For past medical history, uh, he was diagnosed with sickle cell disease at age six and has had six to eight previous hospitalizations um, for that. Um, he has a history of uh, lower extremity ulcers as well, um, but he has never had a pneumococcal vaccine, which is interesting. Uh, his social history includes uh, he's, he lives with his mother and four siblings. He works at Walmart as a stalker, um, but denies any IV uh, drug use or tobacco use. Um, he does consume alcohol uh, occasionally, and last time was this last weekend. Uh, he has two siblings that also have sickle cell disease. Heart rate of 96, uh, respiratory rate of 16, uh, blood pressure of 108 over 70, and his O2 saturation was 89% on room air. Um, for Hent, uh, he's normocephalic, norm atraumatic, perlay. Uh, and extraocular movements are intact uh, with lungs. They're clear to auscultation and percussion with uh, no wheeze. Okay, so, and, and thank you, Texas Tech, for giving us a little pops up, pop up some things. You gotta love it. Um, but let's look at this. So as you all are looking at this and you're just focused on the, the milestone of communication and we specifically were focused on this row, where would you place this learner if this was typical? So I'd love for a couple of people to type into the chat. You would circle level one, level two, level three. If you were just focused on the communication with the family and the patient, with if this is a typical interaction. So type on in there. Would you assess them as being at level one, level two, level three, level four, or level five? Thank you, Danny Johnson, for being bold. Um, so maybe not yet at level one per Danny. Level 1.5 for Kat. Derek, thank you, level two. Level 1.5. <laughs> He's going down. 1.5, one. Thank you to all my friends who know that I'm stressed out here uh, for participating. Um, yeah, great. So one of the great things uh, that Derek Liner points out is normalization. We're all always so nervous and we need to normalize how we evaluate. So getting feedback from others on what behaviors that we're looking for so that we can figure out really what is our assessment um, and, and, and get it toward, get some feedback on it. So yeah, so using language and nonverbal behavior to demonstrate respect and establish rapport. We don't see a lot of that here. Um, he, he starts a little bit with introductions, but then um, he's not really focused on the patient. He's not turning with it. They're not, they don't have the bed up. They're not, there's a lot of stuff um, here in communication skills. Um, so, and this is a pretty straightforward encounter. So I would agree. It's a maybe one, one um, sort of interaction. Think about it. We talked about people can be at different places in different domains. I haven't shared with you the patient care taking history or presentation communication. 
But if you were thinking about how effectively is he presenting or summarizing or did he collect the information, you, I will tell you that he's doing a great job. He might be at level two or level three in that domain. So it's a wonderful example of how people can be at different levels in different domains. It's also a wonderful example of he's not a bad person just because he's a level one. He is an early learner. And so he could use some coaching. And yeah, great point, Kathy. So this is just this interaction. Um, and there we, and Kathy brings up such a great point that when we do this, observation is important. So thank you, Kathy, to that great segue. And I'll come back to it because as Kathy points out, you need to, to be effective at evaluating, we need to be observing. All right, so we'll leave our guy there. Um, I'm hoping that my slides are up. So if, if they're not, Lee, send me a text and tell me that. All right, um, so we evaluated him on this. I just wanna again point out, so those rows out of different milestones are gonna start to show up in your evaluations of residents and fellows. Again, this is an example from cardiology. So cardiology is quite used to this already. Um, and the level of detail doesn't matter here, but this is a new innovations evaluation. And you can see item one is patient care. And it's that row about non-invasive testing. Item two on cardiology's evaluation, this is for the CCU, is patient care, non-invasive testing, row C. Item three is patient care, and it's about acute management, and it's the developmental milestones from that row. Item four is patient care, and it's about acute care management, but it's about um, options for advanced therapies. In cardiology, there are nine items on their evaluation of a fellow in a CCU, and it's the same evaluation for the fellows no matter what year, because again, it's the developmental progression. Item five is around chronic care and discussing treatment strategies. Item six is around critical thinking for diagnosis and therapy. Item seven is on safety and quality row, talking about reporting errors. It's a great thing to have on a CCU evaluation. Um, because so many things happen and when something happens, how, does the person know how to raise concerns? Item eight is about system navigation and item nine is about interpersonal communication skills. So Dr. Callahasty went through 20 something um, sub competencies, each one having one to three rows. So we had to look at, I don't remember, 70 rows and pick out what are the nine right rows for the CCU evaluation. And he picked out different items for the ACE evaluation and different items for cardiology consults and different items for cardiology clinic, but they will all funnel back to give information about the milestones. So let's move to a different framework, which is Entrustable Professional Activities or EPAs. EPAs are used in the undergraduate medical education arena. They are sometimes used in the graduate medical education arena, but right now not that much. They are really what we actually do, a core set of skills in the clinical arena synthesized from milestones. So there's a relationship between EPAs and milestones. So they are things like able to do everything associated with discharging a patient from a hospital, um, performing a set of procedures, et cetera. Core EPAs were developed for entering residency. So these are what you would expect a student to be able to do before they enter residency. These were published in 2014. Um, the group that wrote these was read, led by um, Bob Englander, who is absolutely brilliant. This came out of the work at the AAMC. Again, I had the privilege to be on this writing group. Um, it was really thoughtful, incredibly intentional. It was one of the most um, impressive processes that I've ever been a part of. And at the end of it, again, good consensus building, community input, revisions. Um, there are 13 core EPAs for entering residency. So every graduating medical student should be able to, in a synthetic way, and there are detailed lists of what goes into this, gather a history and perform a physical exam, recommend and interpret common diagnostic tests, enter and discuss orders and prescriptions, document a clinical encounter, provide an oral presentation, and so on. There are also wonderful guides on using these, some of which um, some of our own faculty were a part of writing. So Terry Carter, Adam Garber, um, Mike Ryan, really fantastic work done in the um, core EPA work groups that continue to go on with the AAMC. Much of this work in EPAs or in milestones uses things like supervision or entrustment scales. And here's an example of an entrustment scale that you may see. Again, a developmental set of, do I, 
of do I trust this person? Going from not allowed to practice to allowed to practice with supervision to allowed to practice with on-demand supervision to allowed to practice unsupervised to allowed to supervise. And you can think of that continuum so nicely when you think about, for example, our procedure team. Um, and I'll give a lot of credit to Dr. Garber um, and Dr. Meliagros and Dr. Miller and um, Dr. Ritter who have put together a wonderful procedure team with beautiful scales looking at things like entrustment around procedures. So where does all the information come with from to, to do all this, to figure out where people are in their milestones and their competencies? Well, it comes from you. It comes from you, medical students and interns, when you're giving us feedback about residents and fellows and your faculty members. It comes from faculty members when you're giving us information about the fellows, the residents, the medical students, the interns and fellows and people giving information about peers. So in that clinical teaching environment, we have our trainees and we have our eyes and our ears and people are doing the observations, doing what Dr. Grossman suggests out there, getting a sense of what is this person like when they're in the room? They're listening as the intern talks to the nursing staff or as a medical student is having a discussion with the pharmacist or as the resident is coaching a patient as they teach them about a new medication. And through evaluations and assessments such as clinic workplace evaluations, nursing and personnel evaluations, peer evaluations, self-evaluations, observations in the sim center, end of rotation evaluations, student evaluations, case logs, through all of this information, all of this information feeds up in graduate medical education to the clinical competency committees, um, in undergraduate medical education to the assessment committee. And those committees then gather all that information, synthesize it and make an assessment on where is this learner based on their milestones and EPAs. So we've gotten through competency-based education. We've described milestones and EPAs. You are familiar now with the ACGME Milestones 2.0 projects rolling out now and all the work that everybody's doing behind the scenes to really serve our learners well. Let's dive into your role in direct observation and evaluation and then talk a little bit about feedback. So evaluation and feedback. I always like to start by just getting some definitions out there. Summative versus formative. So we're gonna focus on formative, but contrast it to summative, which is end of training, end of year, final assessment, pass, no pass, your board exam, um, you graduate, you don't. It's heavy, it's formal, it's final, um, it's very decisive. Again, contrast that to formative, which what we're really focused on. Formative evaluation is ongoing. It's for the purpose of improvement. It's that coaching. So for all of our learners, people always think of rotation evaluations as summative. They're formative. They are providing you with that feedback so that you can grow, reach for the new milestones. And so for everybody that's filling out evaluations, all of that information, those words that you put in there, help the learner know what are they doing well and where do they push so that they can grow to that through that developmental set of progression of milestones. So evaluation specifically, because I like to differentiate evaluation from feedback. Evaluation is the process by which the teacher assesses the learner's knowledge, skills, and attitudes based on criteria related to educational goals. And this is a definition that I use frequently from Skeff and Stratos of the Stanford Faculty Development Center. It is direct, intentional observation. So you all were watching that video and hopefully intent on looking at the communication skills. You're looking for specific behaviors and evaluation is most effective if it is based on a framework. And we've been talking about frameworks. We may be using a framework of knowledge, skills, or attitudes, or a framework of competencies and milestones, or the framework of the EPAs, and we're going to talk about our RHYME framework. I do want to highlight the role of direct observation. And again, thank you, Kathy Grossman, um, who really understands that from being where she is in the SIM Center, which is focused on the ability to directly observe learners in an environment. Um, direct observation is key to assessment and we are not at risk of doing it too much. If we're evaluating learners on communication skills, on physical exam skills, on so many things, procedural skills, we are best evaluating them if we are observing them directly in the room. Often we find ourselves saying, oh, they were pretty good at physical exam because they heard that murmur, but I didn't watch them try to elicit the murmur, where they put the stethoscope, how they listened, how intently, how they positioned that patient, et cetera. 
but I should. I love to build on the analogy of if you were training a concert pianist, you would not grab a sheet of music, hand it to them, tell them to go down the hallway, close himself, close the door to the room and come back in an hour and tell you how they did. No, you would sit there next to them, perhaps on the bench with them, and you would watch their positioning and how they held their hands and how they moved and the flow and where they stopped and how they picked it up and the tempo. You would give them feedback on all of that and coach them. And that's how you would know how they played and you'd be listening, but so much from direct observation. Similar as to when we are having learners and they're practicing these skills of communication, physical exam, procedures, et cetera. We need to be in the room, probably more frequently than we are, in order to do this. You don't have to be there all the time, but little snippets here and there, because that's how we really can assess those things. Again, think about training that concert pianist. You're training our concert pianists of internal medicine. So that we talked about intentional observation based on a framework. So the VCU framework in our residency and fellowships are the competencies and the milestones. So we've already talked about how does these milestone 2.0 competencies and milestones fit into our evaluations. And we've shared the example of cardiology, who's just a year ahead of everybody because their milestones came out and Gotham and Jeanette have done an amazing job. Everybody will be looking at evaluations similar to this and that is our framework. So getting to know them and know what you're looking for as you do those direct observations is really, that's our job as we move forward. Let's look a little bit at our undergraduate medical education framework that we use at VCU. And we use the RHYME framework. So many of you know Lou Pangaro. He was here uh, sometime over the last couple of years to speak. Um, Lou is a master educator. He wrote this article, a new vocabulary, new vocabulary and other innovations for improving descriptive in-training evaluations. In, and this was published in Academic Medicine in 1999, hot off the press. Um, this framework has stood the test of time. It is now used at over 50% of medical schools in our country. Um, and if you get to hear Lou Pangaro talk about it, um, and the synthesis of it and um, the flow of it, is, he's beautiful when he talks about it. So the RHYME framework has been validated over and over and over again, um, and uh, people continue to study it um, because of its effective nature. And we use this in our clerkships. And you all are very familiar with evaluating your students based on this scale, R, reporter, I, interpreter, M, manager, E, educator. This is a de description of a developmental progression of a medical student. It is simple, it uses descriptive terminology, things that you can use as you're working with these students. Lou always really points out that this is an analytic and very synthetic framework. While we often think of it as just a knowledge or a skill piece, it actually incorporates knowledge, skills, and attitudes into the framework. And I'll show you a little bit about how that comes together. And he really pushes us to think about it that way when we think about the R, the I, the M, and the E. And for some individuals, they've added a P for professionalism. Lou suggests you don't need to do that. It's built in. And some people um, add an O for observer, so the O rhyme. So it looks like this. And again, it's a developmental progression. There are a set of behaviors that you're looking for in each area. And I will tell you, working with Phoebe Ashley and her team, um, we can do a much better job in writing our evaluations of our learners by thinking about these behaviors. And so think about the last third year medical student that you've worked with. And think about what you circled. And think about, is this what they looked like? So a reporter. A reporter, very much like a news reporter, the reporter gets the story straight. That's their responsibility. They go out, they get information on their own. They don't copy paste. They go out and they get information on their own. They do it with integrity. You can trust them to do that. They are honest in doing it. They own their role. They're in early, they're checking on that patient. They're going back into that clinic room to get something. And they're very proactive. That brings in that professional nature. They can be selective about the information because they can identify some key pertinent positives and negatives. They take ownership. They're gonna call the pharmacy. They're gonna do some other things to get the right information. Reporters answer the what questions about the patient. And like we said, professionalism is incorporated in that R. So that's a student that you were thinking about that. Did that describe them? And it has to be accurate, by the way, information. And so that's a lot. 
to, for a third year student to consistently and accurately and effectively and with ownership and professionalism do all those things, that's what we would want in a medical student. But not everybody's there, particularly not right off the bat, and that's okay. It's a developmental set of progressive milestones. So let's move to the interpreter. Who's the interpreter? We talk about this all the time on the grading committee. I think Phoebe actually wants to kick me off because I'm always confused about interpreter and manager. Um, so Phoebe, I studied. An interpreter is defined by, an interpreter answers the why questions. They consistently offer differential diagnoses. And Lupe and Garrow suggest that when they present a syndrome or a symptom complex to you or presenting symptom, they should consistently have at least three things on their differential. They bring the facts together and analyze and synthesize. They have confidence to offer their interpretation. And that a little bit goes to their self-directed learning, that professionalism aspect. And these have to be reasonable explanations. They don't have to be 100% right. They don't necessarily have that knowledge set to know completely if they're right or not, but they have to be reasonable. And then the manager, this is, again, a struggle. The manager answers the how. They're doing all the things that the interpreter and the reporter do consistently, but now they're moving to diagnostic decisions and therapeutic decisions and going above and beyond. And then an educator level student goes way beyond the basics of self-directed learning. They are using in a sophisticated way, evidence-based medicine to sort through things, to make their therapeutic decisions, and they share their knowledge effectively with patients and with team members. So I'd like to present to you a patient and thinking about R, I, M, and E, as we just described, I'm gonna play this for two and a half to three minutes. And let's talk about at what level do you think this learner is operating? Hi, Michelle. Come on in. Mr. Rodriguez told me how much he enjoyed having you as his doctor, and his family really appreciated it, too. Oh, thank you, Dr. Lansing. Let's go ahead and discuss Mr. Simpson. Okay. Mr. Simpson's a 52-year-old white male. He um, presents today with um, complaining of leg weakness. He's here from a follow-up from your last visit where he was treated for allergic rhinitis. You gave him Flonase, and he says he's feeling better. Um, his general complaints are um, problems with his legs. He presents with a one-month history of progressive leg weakness, and he's actually told me that he and his wife are redoing an old house. They're um, stripping lead-based paint and redoing the floors. Um, he notes he's felt generalized weakness in his legs, so much so that he's even having trouble walking up and down stairs. He's even um, stopped bowling, which is something that he normally does on a regular basis. Um, oh, and when he was here last week, you gave him a CBC, which was normal with a hemoglobin of 14.7. He did have an increase in his eosinophils at 13%, which I think is related to his weakness. Okay. Is there any more history? Any previous neurological problems? Is, is he on any meds? No, no other neurological problems, um, but he, he hasn't been wearing a mask and he's around a lot of dust and paint chips. Okay, let's move on to the physical exam. What did you find there? Um, vital signs were normal, temperature was 97.9, blood pressure was 124 over 80, pulse was 76. Um, his strength was 5 over 5 in the upper extremities and the lower extremities. And I thought he was weak in the upper legs. Where? Um, I, I thought the upper legs were a little weak, but he also seemed weak in his lower leg. It was, it seemed symmetrical, but I couldn't really localize it. What about his sensory exam? It was normal to pin. What about his reflexes, knees, ankles, Babinski? Um, I I thought his knee jerk was good, um, but I had trouble getting his ankle reflex. So what do you think is wrong with Mr. Simpson? Well, I think it was lead, you know, from the paint. Uh-huh. And what other symptoms might there be with lead poisoning? Well, I, th I think he'd be... Okay. So what do you guys think about our learner here? If this is consistent, obviously we just watched a one-time thing. 
But if this was consistent, and this is how typical for her, and you've gone in and observed her, because we talked about direct observation, where would you put her? R, reporter, I, interpreter, M, manager, or E, educator? And go ahead and type into the chat. All right, be bold, Danny Johnson, be first. Danny, you are really fast. So yeah, so working on reporter, oh, not yet consistent reporter, 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 early reporter, barely reporter, early reporter, excellent. Yeah, I would completely agree. So she's a, yeah, we do this all the time on the um, grading committee, um, O slash R. She's working on that reporter thing, but she certainly hasn't mastered that level. So hopefully it was a good example of how we think through this. So as you're evaluating our medical students, please try to remember this framework. Um, about what is what are those specific behaviors that I expect a reporter to be able to do? And you can see specifically that she, um, I'm gonna say that might even, I can't even tell if she actually did everything, she kind of hesitated, but she wasn't able to really selectively identify key pertinent positives that she should be getting. She didn't necessarily get all the facts that we would have wanted. Um, again, doesn't mean she's a bad person, just these are some things that she can work on. Um, when we think about was she doing a differential, she only had one thing, et cetera. So you can specifically look at this and see where you might place her. All right, so let's move to feedback real quickly. So feedback is the process by which the teacher provides the learners with information about their performance for the purpose of improving their performance. So I won't take the time to do it because Lee and I barely figured out how to get you to raise hands, but Think about how uncomfortable you are with feedback. If I asked it, everybody would raise their hand. We're all uncomfortable with this. So let me, let's adopt a positive belief around feedback. Feedback is a gift. And here we have it with the nice Tiffany blue box row, bow. So feedback is a gift for your learners. It is for the purpose of helping them move forward along their trajectory. Positive about feedback. Feedback is important to the concepts of deliberate practice. So the key to developing expertise when, according to Anders Ericsson, who really developed these concepts of deliberate practice, it requires working on a specific goal, we just talked about all the milestones, with intense focus, with constant feedback, which requires a little discomfort for both the learner and the coach, um, and then the opportunity to keep going through that cycle. And that's how we move to expertise. I always use Michael Phelps as a great example. When Michael Phelps gets in the water, a coach is always on deck. Is that because he doesn't know how to swim freestyle? No, the man knows how to swim freestyle. But with a coach standing on deck, they can look at the angle of his arm, his stretch, how far is he from the wall this time? What's the glide like? When did he start the flip turn? All those little subtle things, that constant feedback, those little micro pieces of feedback and change in his performance ultimately leads to the ultimate goal of being the world's best swimmer. So it is the same with our residents. So there's a paradox, medical education literature suggests that learners want feedback, teachers say they get feedback, and learners say they don't receive that feedback. Why? Why? Well, two different things lead to this, and we call them the feedback continuum. One is informal versus formal. We get a lot of informal feedback. So we don't walk around saying this is formal feedback, we're gonna have formal feedback Fridays, we do often, but we also give a lot of the informal in the moment, on the fly. And many times our learners don't recognize that. The other thing that leads to this is that we give a lot of indirect feedback. We give a lot of persuasion. Oh, well, didn't you notice that the white count was elevated? And didn't you notice that the blood pressure was low? And didn't you, and what do you think about signs of sepsis? And we start to question or persuade, didn't you think this? Or we argue, you know, I really think that the patient should be admitted. Oh, well, you're arguing with me. You're not giving me feedback that I actually made a poor assessment. Um, or we role model. We see somebody struggling with a patient uh, communication, maybe delivering bad news, and we stepped in and we role model it and we assume that that was feedback. Um, and so there's a continuum. And sometimes we may need to be more direct so that our learners can actually receive our feedback. So I'm not gonna go into depth about these. Um, these are the characteristics of effective feedback. I have highlighted them so many times in the weekly update this year. I know you're hating to even see that I put them on a slide, um, but they stand the test of the time. And Jack Andy published these um, in 1980. And so you are most effective in giving feedback if you are giving it timely. 
So you're giving it immediately after the observation or as close as possible to the incident. There are times where you don't wanna do that, but the rare fatigue, mood, complication, you're angry, those kind of things. But most of the time you really wanna give it fairly immediately. You're most effective if you're giving feedback frequently. You're most effective if you're giving feedback specific to those behaviors, those milestones. Think about what you could now say to that young lady if you picked right off that list of what a reporter is trying to work on. And that would be specific. You're most effective if you combine reinforcing and constructive feedback. They need to know what they're doing well that they can bring forward. And they need to know where they need to grow. And you are most effective if you elicit a learner reaction. Ask them what they think about the feedback that you gave them or partner with them in doing the next thing, in developing an action plan. I will highlight these again probably several times this year in the weekly update because we as a whole, as a department, can all get better about giving feedback. And there's lots of great ways to do that and lots of great faculty development opportunities. But I will stop there um, and take any questions or any comments. And I would just really encourage people to think about using these behaviors so that you can be more effective in giving feedback and to think about tying them to your direct observation and the milestones. Um, and please don't forget the rhyme because Dr. Ashley sure would like some specific feedback in your rhyme evaluations. So I wanna thank everybody um, and happy to take questions, comments, and we happy for you to help me with the chat. Thank you so much, Dr. Call, that was fantastic. And uh, I've been keeping an eye on the chat. I will also keep an eye on the Q&A. So Danny Johnson had a question about a few minutes ago. Do you see that one in the chat about, actually I've had this same question before. So someone who falls into the interpreter role, but sometimes their reporting may still be lacking. Yeah, so um, yes, we do see that. And Danny, I think that's a super struggle. Um, it, it, the same thing happens with milestones. You see somebody doing a lot of stuff in level three, but actually, they backslid on level one. Um, and if you talk to Eric Holmbo about that, he would argue that they are developmental levels of progression and that an individual really can't, you can't skip. Like that means they backslid. And, um, and so that would be his argument. Um, I have never talked to Lou Pangaro about that specifically with the rhyme schema, but I think that it's the same kind of thing. If they don't have those behaviors, then it's hard to imagine that they're actually integrating effectively because they're actually missing some key elements. So I, uh, I don't know what Lupin Garrow thinks about that, but I, but I um, think that you, they're building blocks and you just can't skip. It's like my daughter's, you know, putting three words together effectively going to talking paragraphs, like, but then the paragraphs don't make sense, right? So um, I think then they're really at that first level. It's a great question. And I might be wrong. I'm totally open to the fact that what I just said might've been wrong to full disclosure. I see another thing from the VA. Can you comment regarding methods to deliver bad news and evaluations? Ah, and willingness to document in writing. Thank you for asking that question. It's a gift. None of this is positive or negative about the learner, right? It's not personal. It's about their behaviors and their um, performance and meeting the milestones. And you're giving this feedback and writing those comments to help them grow. And so the only bad thing you can do is not give it. That's the only bad thing you can do. Um, and, and, you know, and when we talk about real great faculty development and feedback, we talk a lot about learning climate and, and really making sure that your learners know that you care or your team members. These things go for team members, coaching a youth soccer team. They don't work very well with husbands. Don't tell my husband I just said that, but packaging feedback is all about learning climate. I care about you. That's why I'm giving you this feedback. I wanna push you. I want you to be outstanding. Here's what I see behaviors that you're doing really well and behaviors where I think you need to grow. So I think it belongs in writing, it belongs in verbal feedback and, um, and, and it's hard and it's uncomfortable, but you are giving a gift and you can do it really well. Oh, Dr. Gear, evaluation fatigue, it's terrible. And I will suggest that the new evaluations that are rolling out in cardiology, faculty could talk about this and so could um, pulmonary faculty and hemoc faculty, they are a high cognitive load. So I have suggested to all fellowship directors, and I know Laura Paletta Hobbs is following this at all, that um, the 
we need to keep the evaluations to eight items or less because there's a high cognitive load to read through each developmental set of milestones. This is not a one to nine. You actually have to read the descriptor and figure out where the person is. And then, yeah, there's a high volume of evaluations because everybody evaluates everybody. And I'm not exactly sure what to do about that, um, except for that we should make them shorter, we should make them um, easier to do, and we should make our systems work better for you all. And that's on us in education. And Laura, it's a great point that written evaluations should never be a surprise. Um, they should always follow a sit down. I actually like to do my written evaluations and then sit down with my learner and go over it so that when they then receive it electronically, they've already seen it. Now I will tell you, they will still say that was a surprise to me, but I know that we sat down and had a conversation about it. It's hard to receive those. So you do want to follow up with that written because then they can really process that. All right, I think I covered all those. All right, thanks you all so much. It's so fun to talk about an area that I love so much where there's so much new stuff going on. Um, so please do great evaluations, give great feedback, observe people and let your program director and coordinator know what's working and what's not working with the new evaluation structures. And, and please let Dr. Ashley and her team know what's not working with the clerkship evaluations. Thank you to everybody once again, have a wonderful afternoon and um, have a great weekend.